But anyway, we're ready to proceed um, right away today and continue with the state's case. Attorney Mary Kerrigan, are you ready to go? Thank you. Right, go okay. ahead and call your next witness. Thank you. We call Ma Madison Miskern to the stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you that? I do. Please state your full name and spell your last name. Madison Miskern, K-N-I-S-K-E-R-N. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Just adjust the mic to wherever you're comfortable. Okay. And I'm going to ask you, um, if I may, can you give us an um, outline of your educational um, degrees and uh, your experience? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from Carroll College. I was then employed by the Arkansas State Crime Lab as a controlled substance analyst, where I received on-the-job training for that. And then in November of 2010, I was employed by the Wisconsin State Crime Lab as a controlled substance analyst, and I added the duties of a crime scene response photographer and team leader. So in 2010, you came to the Wisconsin Crime Laboratory? Yes. Um, did you re receive any specific training with respect to crime scenes? We receive in-house training as well as attend uh, various seminars or have in-house um, other agencies provide training as well. And your present duties are what at this point in time? I am a controlled substance analyst as well as a crime scene response team leader. What is a controlled substance analyst? I analyze substances submitted to the crime lab for the presence of controlled substances. And what does a crime scene, crime scene response team leader do? I am the person that coordinates the, um, the and, uh, processing of a crime scene. I'm the go-between between, between the agency and the crime lab personnel. And when an agency requests our assistance, we go and help them process the, any type of scene that they have result, revol, involving homicide. Is it strictly homicide cases? Typically. Between those two duties, um, is there a certain percentage you do more, one more than the other? I am predominantly a controlled substance analyst. But in 2010, is that when you started working the crime scenes as well? I started doing crime scenes in right around 2012. Have you had a number of times you've actually gone to the scene of what uh, has been reported to be a scene of a crime? Yes. Approximately how many times? I've been to approximately 40, a combination of crime scenes as well as processing vehicles approximately 41 times. Are there times that uh, the evidence or suspected um, items that they want you to examine are, are brought to your lab? I only analyze controlled substances in the lab. So if you, um, if you do an um, examination of a vehicle, where would that take place? That would take place at the, at the lab, but I do not analyze with instrumentation anything oh. collected from the vehicle. So poor choice of words. Examinations would be a better choice with respect to vehicles? Correct. Okay. And that would also take place at the lab? Correct. Sometimes would you ever do it on the scene, or is it always a better idea to get it to your lab and then do your work? Processing vehicles is easier and in a more controlled environment at the crime lab. Okay. Has your training um, been ongoing since you came over to Wisconsin Crime Laboratory? Yes. Um, so there's been some formal training outside just um, the work-related efforts that you're doing, is that correct? Could you repeat the question? You have had specific training aside just from your work assignments, is that correct? That's correct. When you say process, what do you mean process? We have a series of steps that we go through uh, for our manual uh, for any item that comes into the lab. In this line of work then, did you become involved in a case named, to you it was indicated, Nicole Vanderheiden? Yes. And on May 26th of 2016, was there a vehicle submitted for your um, examination? Yes, there was. Where was it submitted to? It was submitted to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in Wausau. Is that your primary workplace? Yes. By Mayor Coach? Go ahead. I'm going to show you Mr. Mark's Exhibit 87. Can you identify that document, please? This is a copy of my report for laboratory case number W16-1387. And that would be your crime laboratory number? Yes. Uh, is there also an agency number listed on that document? Yes, there is. And what would that be? 16-20716. Would that be the submitting law enforcement agency's number? Yes. Okay. 
So the W number is a number that you create or your department creates upon the receipt of, of an item? Correct. And what is the date of your report? The report's dated June 6th of 2016. Okay. And who's the author of the report? I am. With respect to the report then, it's, um, am I correct, a two-page document? Yes. In this particular uh, situation then, who submitted uh, the evidence and what was it? It was Brown County Sheriff's Office and they submitted a gray Buick Rendezvous. Do you have a specific description of the vehicle? And if you need to refer to your document, go ahead. Okay. I have a description that it, the item submitted was a vehicle and we identify it as item B. It was a 2004 gray Buick Rendezvous with Wisconsin license plate 364-UZR and VIN 3G5DB03EX4 S514754. Thank you. Did you have that VIN number memorized before today? I did not. <laughs> Thank you. So you received it, were you um, working in the lab on the date that the vehicle came in? Yes. Okay. And what was your assignment then? What does one do once such uh, vehicles are submitted? In general? Sure. Um, when vehicles are submitted to the crime lab, they are photographed as is before they're unloaded and then they're placed in our garage in a secure location. And depending on what the agency requests for with the vehicle is, that caters what we do for uh, processing the vehicle. Was there a specific request with this vehicle as to what they were hoping you would look for? Yes. What were you supposed to make determinations about? They were looking for any blood evidence in the vehicle. Have you experienced looking for blood evidence? Yes. Is that um, among your duties as to when you're doing these examinations? Yes. What type of means are you able to utilize besides visual to make determinations about the possible presence of blood? We have a, a light source that we can use for blood as well as any stains that I locate. I am able to use um, phenolphthalein, which is a presumptive test for blood. And as well as um, after all the visible stains are located, I can use luminol to see if there are any signs of um, blood that is not immediately visible to the eye. So what does luminol do? Luminol reacts with blood and it produces a blue glow that I can then visually see as well as the photographer can photograph this and that it can be further swabbed for DNA. And is it a definitive determination if you use luminol? No, it is not. What is it? It is a presumptive test. So it's, it's an indicator, but it's not a definite. Correct. And what was the other chemical that you say can be utilized at times? Phenolphthalein. And what does that do? That is also a presumptive test for blood. So that's what you do in general. With the receipt of this vehicle on May 26, 2016, can you take us through what you did with this specific <laughs> vehicle, the rendezvous? Stacy Gordon, my photographer, photographed the vehicle when it came in. It was then put in the garage. And then over the next couple of days, the vehicle was examined visually, um, just looking at it, what we can see on the surface, looking for blood on the exterior of the vehicle. I then did several swabs of door handles, and then the interior of the vehicle was searched for blood. Can you tell me, and if you need to reference your report, feel free, what specific days was this vehicle worked upon? Um, the vehicle was looked at on May 27th, the 31st, and June 1st and 2nd of and 2016. Thank you. So someone photographs the vehicle. Is that a number of photographs? Yes. In fact, in this case, if, do you know how many photographs were taken? If I can look at my report? Sure. There were 279 photos taken. Okay. Is, are all the photographs taken before you actually do any further work? Is that the first thing that happens? The exterior is photographed and then um, the exterior is processed for what I need to process. So for instance, in this case, swabbing door handles, then the door ha doors are opened and the interior photos are taken before any type of testing or ex further examinations are done. So once the photographs are done, with respect to this specific vehicle, what did you do? We examined the interior of the vehicle for any visible stains. Did you also do the exterior observations and examination that you mentioned? Yes. Okay. With respect to the exterior, did you note anything of significance or had that might have evidentiary value? I did notice one possible stain on the exterior door handle, which was tested with phenolphthalein and it was negative, so it was not collected. Negative as to what? 
for the presence of indication of the presence of blood. And that was the outside door handle? Correct. And you said all the door handles were checked, is that correct? Yes. What did you then do? Once the interior was photographed, the any stains were marked and re-photographed with a, a numbered marker, and then they were tested with phenothalein to see if there was the indication of the presence of blood. If there was, the item was swabbed, the stain was swabbed and collected. Now, if I can back you up a bit, when you're back to the exterior of the vehicle, um, is there any swabbing taking place at this point in time? The exterior of the handles were swabbed for DNA. Okay. And are you collecting and numbering those swabs? Yes. Could you tell me what you did with respect to the exterior door handles? The exterior door handles were swabbed individually and they were identified as items B1 through B5. Okay. But none of those had a, indicated a presence of blood, is that correct? I did not notice any staining. With respect to the rest of the exterior of the vehicle, was there anything of significance that was noted when you were examining it? No, I did not note anything. Okay. Um, did you continue then in, into the interior? Are you also marking things as you make note of them? Correct. So what did you do then? Once they're marked, I test the suspected stains with phenothalene to see if there is the indication for the presence of blood. I then swab any of them that do indicate the presence of blood and retain them to be sent to the Madison Crime Lab. Okay. With respect to um, swabbing that you did in this case then, did you mark further ones and take further swabs? Yes. Um, as to the interior door handles, what did you do? The interior door handles were swabbed. And what numbers were those assigned? Um, may I refer to my report? Please. Um, the interior door handles were collected as items B6 through B9. Thank you. And did you make any further notes with respect to the tailgate interior? Yes. What was that? The tailgate interior, there were fibers, and that was collected as item B10. And then there were also um, tan fibers in the trunk area at marker four, which were collected as, um, excuse me, B11. And those were tan fibers located on the ceiling, did you say, above the trunk area? Yes. Okay. So now we're up to B11. Did you take any action with respect to the steering wheel? Yes. What did you do? I swabbed the steering wheel for touch DNA. And what um, swab designation was that given? B what? That was B B12. And then with respect to the gear shift, did you take any swabs? Yes. What designation did you give those B what? B13. Did you collect any units as well? What was that? Did you collect any TomTom -tom units as well? Yes, I did. And what did you number that? I identified that as item B14. When did you use um, the chemical presumptive test? Was that as you're going item by item, or how does that work? It's as I go item by item. The items are marked, or the stains are marked in the interior, and they're photographed, and then I go through and test the stains. Uh, and anything that indicates the presence of blood are then swabbed and collected. So up to B14, have you done all of your testing, including luminol, or is, you haven't used the luminol yet? I have not done the luminol yet. Okay. Um, did you note any other uh, things that caught your eyes, such as any stains? Yes. And where was that? The stain on the rear um, third row seat behind the driver, there was a stain that I identified. What action did you take with respect to that stain? I tested that stain with phenothalene, and the result was a presumptive positive. Or blood? Correct. And what number did you give that stain? I identified that as item B15. How do you apply the phenothalene? Is that by, you take the swab of it and apply it to that, or do you apply it directly to the stain? It is on a, done, all done on a swab. Okay. It's from that area that you observed the stain? Correct. Um, so there you have, is that first time after using, and you've already used phenothalene on B1 through B14, is that correct? Phenothalene was used on multiple stains. I don't know which one's off the top of my head without referring to my notes. Okay. All, the, all these areas were examined for the possible presence of blood, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, is there any point there that you did, a, you, you mentioned that B15, the stain on the driver's side third row seat, that was the only one that had the presumptive indicator for possible blood? Correct. Um, so at some point in time, do you also use luminol? Correct. And where do you, what do you do with that? 
The luminol is sprayed in the interior of the vehicle in sections so that the photographer can set up a camera to photograph the results as the luminol is being sprayed. And did you find anything of evidentiary value utilizing the luminol? I did not. And that was throughout the whole vehicle, is that correct? Correct. With respect to the items that did not test as possibly indicating the presence of blood, B1 through B15, what did you do with those items? B1 through B15, uh, with the exception of B15, they were all returned to the agency. And I'm sorry, B1 through B14 all went back to the Brown County Sheriff's Department? That's correct. Good. Those all be were negative with respect to any, any blood indicators? I did not test those with phenothaline. But they, were they involved with the luminol testing? They were not. Okay. B15 was tested with the phenothaline? Correct. Swabs themselves, B through 14, you said you didn't use the phenothalene, is that correct? That's correct. But the areas from which they were taken, those areas were all, you did utilize the luminol in those areas? Luminol is applied to all surfaces in the interior of the vehicle after all collection has been completed. And all of those same sections indicated no presence of blood, is that correct? Items B1 through B14, they were the exterior of the vehicle, so B1 through B9 were, were swabs of interior and exterior door handles. They were not tested with phenothaline and they were not tested with luminol. They were simply swabs for the presence of DNA. So that was for DNA purposes, not for other determinations? Correct. With respect to B15, where did that um, specific swab go? That swab was then transferred to the Madison Crime Lab. And that was, again, the stain on the driver's side, third row seat that you sent that off to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory, a, a different location? Correct. We'd ask that um, number 87 be received into evidence. Subject to cross, any objection to 87, the crime lab report? No, thank you. All right, 87 is received. Did I see, oh, do you have a copy of 87 for the court? If not, that's Oh, yes, that's I'm fine. sorry. That way I can follow along. Um, did you also thank you. find a progressive device um, when you're examining the steeple? Did it have any other devices that, that you noted in your notes? Yes. It was a progressive snapshot. What did, and what in fact is that? I don't know for sure. Okay. okay. And did you do anything with that specific item? I recall recorded the serial number of the device and then uh, kept it in the vehicle. Okay. So you, you made note of it and that was also made known to law enforcement, is that correct? That's correct. That plugged into the vehicle. It was. Okay. The state has no further questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Cross examination. Thank you, Judge. So, when you were conducting your examination of this vehicle, you were in contact with law enforcement from the Brown County Sheriff's Office? That's correct. Do you remember who in particular? I would need to refer to my notes. You can do that. I spoke with Brian Slinger. And did Sergeant Slinger ask you to measure the position of the driver's seat? He did. And did you find in your examination of the vehicle that there was two programmed positions of the driver's seat? There was a memory one and a memory two position. And what position was the vehicle in when you examined it? I don't know. Do you remember measuring what it was in? I do, I have the approximate measurements in my notes. Can you tell us what those were? I believe it's on page 12 at the bottom. Uh, the current position of the driver's seat as it was 
I was approximately 29 degrees leaning back, 14 and 5 eighths of inches from the parking brake to the side plastic on the driver's seat, and approximately 15 and a half inches from the floor to the high point on the side of the driver's seat. And that was the current position when you examined the vehicle? Correct. And you didn't move that beforehand? No. And then what about the other memory position? What is the length from the driver's seat to the parking brake? I then did two additional measurements, one pushing the position two button and one pushing the position one button. Um, the position two button was 20 degrees leaning back, approximately 11 and a quarter inches from the parking brake to the side plastic on the driver's seat and approximately 15 inches from the floor to the high point on the side of the driver's seat. Position one was selected and measured, and it was approximately 25 degrees leaning back, 14 and a quarter inches from the parking brake to the side plastic on the driver's seat, and approximately 15 and 5 eighths inches from the floor to the high point on the driver's seat. So in terms of comparison, the current position when you measured that was closer to position one, correct? Correct. And position one was further from the driver's seat to the parking brake, correct? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have no further questions. Can you redirect? Oh, no, I'd ask that you be excused. Thank you. You may step down. You are excused. You call your next witness. Thank you. Let's see, we call Katie Hoffmeyer to the stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? I do. Please state your full name and spell your last name. My name is Katie Hoffmeyer, spelled H O F F M E Y E R. Thank you. And you may be seated and just come in here the microphones and whenever you're ready, counsel. Ms. Hoffner, can you uh, give us an outline of your education? My educational background um, consists, I have a bachelor's of science degree in biomedical sciences with a minor in chemistry from Grand Valley State University in Allendale, Michigan. I also have a master's of science degree in forensic sciences from Boston University. When did you get that degree? I received my master's degree in 2010. I started my career at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in 2011. And where are you presently employed? I currently work at the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory in Wausau. What, uh, do you have an official title or what type of duties do you do? My official title is a Forensic Sciences Training Coordinator. I have duties and responsibilities as a crime scene response team leader. And is that the same type of duties that when you first um, were hired that you were involved with? Um, I began training as a team leader in 2013. I also have additional duties at the laboratory. So what were your type of duties with respect to 2011 when you first started? I was hired as a controlled substances analyst. Okay. And did that expand to other areas after some time? Yes. Okay. And when would that have been? Um, I began training as a team leader in 2013, and then in June of 2017, I was promoted to the Forensic Sciences Training Coordinator position, um, where part of my responsibilities also include um, being the laboratory safety and quality manager. Are there times you get outside the laboratory and work scenes themselves? Yes, I do. And in what type of situations? As a crime scene response team leader, I respond to crime scenes um, primarily in the northern half of Wisconsin to assist with primarily homicide investigations. What laboratory do you work out of? I work at the Wausau Laboratory. And have you always been at the Wausau Laboratory? Yes. So can you tell us approximately how many times you've gone to the scene of a crime to assist in some fashion? I've assisted with approximately 40 crime scenes or vehicle processing. Have there also been times that you take in potential evidence to your laboratory and do examinations or work on items that are sent to you? 
Yes. Approximately how many times has that happened? Five to ten times. In June of 2016, specifically June 3rd of 2016, was there a vehicle submitted to your laboratory for examination or analysis? Yes, there was. And who submitted that vehicle? The vehicle was submitted by the Brown County Sheriff's Office. And if you need to um, review your report, uh, you may. Can you give us a specific description of the vehicle, please? The vehicle that was submitted to the laboratory was a 1999 black Buick Park Avenue. And can you tell me the plate and the VIN number, please? I would need to refer to my report. Sure, thank you. The license plate number for the vehicle was 520-NLV. And the VIN number? And the VIN number was 1G4CU5215X460-3805. Now, was someone assisting you with this um, examination? Yes. And who would that have been? Another forensic scientist named Zi Zhang was assisting me in primarily taking the photographs of the vehicle. Okay. And were photographs taken? Yes, they were. Uh, how many actually were taken with respect to the vehicle? Can I refer to my report? Please. 142 images were taken. So a description of how you then proceeded with this vehicle. What did you first do? When the vehicle was submitted to the laboratory, we first um, started the documentation process through photographs, and then the vehicle was examined visually just to look for any items of evidence that may be pertinent to the case or blood evidence specifically. So I, both myself and Zhang had examined the vehicle looking for any traces amounts of blood and then the last step of our vehicle processing was to use luminol, which is um, a chemical used to look for trace amounts of blood, and then after that we were completed. So at first, do you do an exterior examination? Yes. And, and that was done in this case, is that correct? Yes. Um, anything that you noted specifically with respect to the exterior of the vehicle? No. And then you actually, before you move inside, you do some swabbing? Yes, I did swab the exterior and interior door handles of the vehicle, as well as the steering wheel and gear shift. And did you give those uh, a letter and a number, each of those swabbings? Yes, I did. What were the exterior ones labeled as? Can I refer to my report? Sure, thank you. The swabs of the exterior door handles were collected as item, items R1 through R4. And swabbing of the interior door handles, what were those labeled? The swabs of the interior door handles were collected as R5 through R8. So once your examination and your photographs are done with respect to the exterior, you move to the interior and start your work? Yes. What did you do then? The interior, we did the same process where I visually looked for any possible stains inside of the vehicle and then used luminol. And in fact, did you spot any stains in this vehicle? Yes, I did. Um, what did you do then when you noted the stains? We documented the stains and then I used a presumptive test known as phenolphthalein, which will turn a pink color in the presence of blood. I tested those stains with the presumptive test. Did you receive a result? Yes, I did. Was it the same for all of them? Yes. And what was it? All stains that I tested were negative. For the presence of blood? For the presence of blood, yes. Did you do some further swabbing while you were inside the vehicle? No, I did not. Okay. Um, the steering wheel, was that swabbed? I'm sorry. No yes. Problem. Yes. The steering wheel and the gear shift were swabbed inside of the vehicle prior, prior to, to doing that. And that was what you labeled R9 and R10? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, so you looked it all over on the inside, and you're, you're looking for stains. That's your job, correct? Yes. And so any of the stains that you noted that were present, those were all tested with the phenolphthalein, is that right? Correct. And all of those came back negative for blood? Yes. Um, did you then examine further using any other substances with respect to 
the interior of the vehicle? Yes. And that was using what? I used luminol. And luminol, you get a blue color? Yes, so luminol is applied to, it's sprayed on the surfaces of the interior in the vehicle for this case, and you do it in the dark. And in the presence of blood, um, you will see a luminescence or a blue glow from the positive reaction. And with respect to the vehicle then, your entire search of the vehicle, did the luminol show any indicators of the presence of blood? There were um, positive or luminescence or reactions that were observed, but those, um, those areas were then marked and then followed up with the phenolphthalein presumptive test for blood um, just to um, test the stain further to see if they were positive or negative. And what was the result? I tested three additional stains which were negative. So is there anything of evidentiary value um, detected and observed after your very thorough examination? I did not test or did not locate any items that tested positive or presumptively positive for the presence of blood. So there was nothing of evidentiary value, is that correct? Correct. Um, we would ask Exhibit 88 be uh, admitted into evidence, please. <clears throat> Subject to cross, any objection to 88, Ms. Hoffmeyer's report? 88 is received. I'm going to ask you to identify Exhibit 88, and I'm sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. And what exactly is that? State, state Exhibit number 88 is the laboratory report that I generated for this case, um, laboratory case number W161387. And I recognize this by my signature on the report. Thank you. And your um, report is dated June 13th, 2016? Yes, it is. Did you also apply a case number to this uh, assignment for the Wisconsin Crime Lab? Yes. And what was the crime lab number? Laboratory case number W161387. And do you also have reflected on that report uh, the Brown County Law Enforcement Agency report number? Yes, I do. And what is that? The agency case number is 16-20716. Thank you. And again, you were the actual author of the report, is that correct? Yes, I was. Uh, thank you. Now I would ask that it be admitted into evidence. And that is the same report you referenced earlier in your testimony? Yes, it is. All right, then. You have a good record. 88 is received. Right, thank you. No further questions. Cross-examination. None. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. You may step down and you are excused. Okay, thank you. State's next witness. State calls uh, Detective Sergeant Brian Slinger. Excuse me, your name is Indian Square to Tell the Truth. I hope you can tell the truth, so help you down. I do. Please state your full name and spell your last name. Brian Slinger, S as in Sam, L I N G E R. Whenever you're ready, Attorney Saunders. Can you state for the record how you're currently employed? I'm employed by the Brown County Sheriff's Office. And what is your title with that office? I'm an investigative sergeant uh, within the investigative division. How long have you been specifically an investigative sergeant for? I've been an investigative sergeant since August of 2015. Is that the entirety of your experience as a law enforcement officer? No, I was hired in May of 2000, so this May I'll be 18 years with the Brown County Sheriff's Office. During that time, I worked um, as a patrolman for 11 or so years of that time, and then I was also a narcotics investigator in the drug task force um, prior to my promotion to sergeant. Could you describe uh, briefly your, your education and training prior to your appointment as a police officer? Sure, so I went to Fox Valley Technical College, got a two-year associate degree in criminal justice where I also uh, attended the police academy there. I was certified um, law enforcement through the state of Wisconsin at that time. Uh, I was hired shortly thereafter by the Appleton Police Department where I worked for a year um, in a community service role. And then I worked uh, for another year in the Calumet County Jail before being hired at the Sheriff's Office here in Brown County in 2000. In the course of your duties as a law enforcement officer, do you continue to receive training with respect to your employment? 
Correct. Um, I've been to numerous trainings through the FBI, DEA, DCI, which is Department of Criminal Investigations, um, Department of uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, as well as Department of Justice um, as it relates to death scene investigations, interview interrogation techniques, um, crime scene uh, photo photography, as well as um, some other specialized death scenes, um, underwater death scenes and things like that. Specifically with respect to your, your current role, uh, what are some of your duties as an investigative sergeant? Uh, we're assigned numerous cases. They can range anywhere from a simple retail theft all the way up to sexual assault, substantial batteries, or homicides. Um, we get the cases assigned to us, we review the reports, and we begin our investigation by um, whatever we feel necessary. Directing your attention to May of 2016, uh, did you become involved in an investigation into the death of Nicole Vanheim? I did. And what was your role uh, initially in that investigation? Uh, initially, I was contacted on Saturday, May 21st, to come in for a body that was found in the field. Um, I was unable to come in that day to, due to another um, engagement that I had. There was the CELCOM marathon was that weekend, and I had some obligations to do with that. So I wasn't able to come in and assist until the following morning on Sunday when the marathon was over. So I, I believe I got there sometime around 10, 11 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, the 22nd. Sure, come right ahead. Okay, we just had a brief uh, sidebar just to discuss um, um, the extent of the uh, examination. So we're all on the same page and we can continue. I believe we left off on, on May 22nd. Correct. I was called in on that morning on the 22nd. And, and on this. that, sorry, and on that date, uh, what duties did you perform? Uh, I responded to the Sheriff's Office, met with Lieutenant Valley and Captain Conrad at the time, was advised of the situation, um, kind of brought up to speed on everything. Um, I reported out to the, the field where the body was located. Um, it had already been removed. Um, I assisted in coordinating a grid search of the area with other officers and other investigators that were out there. Um, to try and find any items that we may have deemed of evidentiary value at that time. Where did that grid search occur? Uh, we started at pretty much right where the body was located um, and then moved to the east and then also to the west towards where that entry road was that we've all seen on the pictures. And then we kind of moved to the south um, where that large mound was um, into the field. Were you the only investigator participating in that search? No, there was, I, I can't tell you how many, but there was a large number of us that were kind of doing a grid search where, kind of explained earlier, you walk side to side in arm's length of each other to try and check the area to see if anything would catch your eye. What sort of items are you looking for at that point? Well, at that time I had information that it was a, a blunt force trauma. Um, Sergeant Lopnow and I had been in communications. He was um, down with the crime lab and had, he had witnessed the body. Um, so we were looking for any sort of items that may have caused that damage. Um, like stated earlier, there's a lot of rocks and a lot of things like that in the field that could potentially have been used. So we were looking through those rocks to see if there may have been any blood or any other sorts of evidence on any of those rocks. And did you find anything of evidentiary value during that search? We did not. And again, this was on May 22nd, correct? Correct, on Sunday. Do you recall approximately what time? Um, sometime later in the morning, closer to noon, possibly. I, I don't recall the exact time. I know I had went over there once the, the race was over with, so it probably had to be 10, 11, somewhere in that time frame. And you recall approximately for how long? Um, we were a good couple hours. Um, it's obviously, you've seen the pictures, it's a rather large field and um, a rather large area to try and go through. It's pretty bare, so it wasn't difficult terrain or anything, um, but we wanted to make sure we did a thorough job. So apart from the grid search, were you asked to perform any other duties at that time? So yeah, once the grid search was done, um, I was advised um, of this missing person report that was filed the day prior, um, and that a statement had been taken from Mr. Dietrich um, advising of the acts uh, that happened on Friday night. So uh, I went and reached out to a bunch of the witnesses that he had advised law enforcement that he was out with um, to try and get statements from them. Did you speak with those individuals? I spoke with quite a few of them. I, I don't remember offhand which exact witnesses that I spoke to. Um, there was a handful of them that I went out and um, obtained written statements from to get their accounts of the night prior. And at a certain point in the investigation, did you assume, I guess we'll call it lead investigator, 
status? Correct. Initially on Sunday, I was advised that Sergeant Lopnow was going to be the lead case agent on this and that I would be assisting him. Um, however, due, due to the lengthy autopsy process and the fact that he was down in Madison for two days, he had kind of lost some knowledge of the case, so to speak, as far as what was happening back here in Green Bay, what was happening with interviews, searches, things of that nature. So it was discussed. Um, I don't remember the exact date and time, but probably somewhere on Monday on the 23rd. Um, I was approached by Lieutenant Valley and Captain Conrath and asked if I would take the lead role in this investigation and work with Sergeant Lobnow. And what does that role specifically entail? Um, so my role in this was obviously to go back, review all the reports, all the statements, all the information that we currently had so that I could get myself up to speed as to where everything was. I, I was not at the scene um, at, at Doug Dietrich and Nicole Van Heiden's residence. I was not there, so I needed to freshen myself up on what that scene entailed at the house um, when that search warrant had been done that night prior. Um, and then I also directed assisting personnel to write different search warrants, um, went out and tried to make arrangements to get different surveillance video recovered, um, and then basically analyzed any information that would come back to me from those assignments that I asked other officers to assist me with. That initial review of, of all the evidence in the case did that process continue throughout this entire investigation? Correct. Um, as, as, as information and evidence um, evolved to us, um, it, that's what led us in the direction of the investigation. So it's fair to say, as the, the lead investigator in this case, you're aware of, of every facet of the investigation? Yes. With respect to the initial investigation, was there a search conducted at Mr. Dietrich's residence on Berkeley Road? Yes, I was aware of two search warrants that were done at the residence. Um, one would have been late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, and then the second on the 23rd. Sunday morning, what date would that be? That would be the 22nd. In the early morning hours, you said? Yeah, I, like I said, I don't remember if they did it late on the 21st or early on the 22nd. I, I don't have that exact time. When was the second search done? Second one was done on the night of the 23rd, which would have been Monday. With respect to the first search, are you aware of the items that were located? I'm aware of the items that were located, yes. And with respect to, um, I believe we've heard testimony, there were shoes recovered from the residence, correct? Correct. And why was that significant from an investigative standpoint? Uh, through my communications with Sergeant Lopnow and uh, the Dr. Rogalska that you'd heard from earlier, um, we had determined that there was a herringbone or zigzag type pattern that was um, apparent on Ms. Van der Heiden's body um, that would be consistent with potentially a bottom of a shoe, um, and in particular uh, a, a Air Jordan brand that would have that herringbone pattern. Additionally, are you aware of whether there were any vehicles located at the residence? There was one vehicle, a 2004 Buick Rendezvous, which is like a, an SUV type vehicle that was parked in the garage. Through the course of your investigation, was it determined who was the owner of that vehicle? Uh, the registration, I believe, came back to Nicole Vanderheide and either that or one of her parents or something. I don't remember exactly who it was registered to, but it was determined to be Nicole's primary vehicle. And were there other, any other vehicles located at, at the residence? There were not. Was, going back to the shoes, were any shoes located in the residence? Um, as you've seen earlier in those photos, there was quite a few shoes in the shoe rack in the garage. Um, all those shoes were examined for um, any indication of blood or any other substance that may be thought to be blood, um, as well as any shoes that would have that herringbone pattern on the bottom. And there were several shoes that were collected ultimately. Yeah, I believe there's two pairs, the white pair that we had seen earlier, and then there was another pair of, I think they were Adidas, that had a completely different design on the bottom, but they did have some sort of red substance on them that we felt would need to be tested. And with respect to the vehicle that was seized by Nicole, was that also seized? That was seized um, and then ultimately maintained in our custody and then we made arrangements, as you heard, with the Wausau Crime Lab to have the vehicle transported there um, so that it could be processed by their people there. In addition to searches of residence, residences, uh, what other investigative measures were taken in the initial stages? 
Initial stages is obviously your, your fact gathering, your witness statement gathering, your data gathering. Um, surveillance video was very big for us at this time. We had um, another thing that I had done on Sunday that we didn't talk about was I went out to um, the sardine can, um, canvassed that neighborhood again very good, checked houses to make sure that there was no cameras that may have been missed on individuals' houses. Um, we were able to locate a couple residences in that area, I believe on Maple Street off of Howard that did have surveillance cameras. Um, and we were also able to make contact with the owner of the sardine can who um, allowed us to take physical custody of his um, hard drive because we weren't able to get it to, we couldn't figure out how to download the video so he actually just gave us the whole computer. In addition to those surveillance videos, did you obtain any other uh, surveillance videos of other locations? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you how many surveillance videos we took. We went through the city of Green Bay, took surveillance videos from each one of the bridges, um, the Nitschke Bridge, the Walnut Street Bridge, um, Mason Street Bridge, contacted City De Pier, received the video surveillance from the De Pier Bridge. Um, that would come into play later on because we were obviously to get from the west side to the east side. Um, you'd have to check, you'd have to go over one of those bridges. Um, otherwise, you'd be talking uh, Highway 172 or I-43, which we also did get video from the state of Wisconsin. And specifically with respect to the surveillance video from the bridges, why did you feel that was significant? Well, at the time, we, we weren't sure um, how Nicole got home. You know, there was the, the known that she was last seen walking south on Maple Street from Howard Street. That was confirmed by um, Aaron Klinsky, as well as some other people that he had spoke about earlier at that bonfire. Um, so, you know, it's a long walk, but we had that possibility that she potentially could have walked home. So we watched hours and hours of video of those bridges to see if you could see anyone walking across any of those bridges. And you ultimately did review all of that video surveillance? Correct, and myself with some assistance from some of our um, crime analysts that we have. I, I can't say that I watched every single hour of all those bridge videos, but myself and people that were with me um, were responsible for that, yes. And were you able to locate anything of significance? Nothing of significance with anyone walking across the bridges, no. Were you also aware whether any neighborhood canvases were completed? Yeah, there's neighborhood canvases done um, in Nicole and Doug's neighborhood as well as in the neighborhood of the Sardine Can. Was anything of significance gained from those interactions? Not to my knowledge. Um, you know, we like I said, we did get some video from some people in the neighborhood on Maple Street that we were able to review um, to see if we could see her walking in that area. It's, it is a very dark neighborhood. There's not a lot of street lights. And the video that he had did not show a good angle of, of where, we, where she was likely walking. So we weren't able to get anything out of that. In addition to those measures, um, was there also a period where search warrants were drafted? Yeah, there was, I, I couldn't tell you again how many exact search warrants were drafted, but um, we drafted search warrants for phones, for phone records, for Facebook accounts, for uh, Snapchat or Snapchat, uh, Snapchat accounts, um, as well as Google accounts, uh, search warrants for the vehicles, um, as well as we already talked about the search warrants for the residences. With respect to some of those technological records you just referenced, uh, which individuals uh, or who um, whose records were you seeking? At the beginning, the, mo the, the majority of the records were Nicole's, um, Doug's, Greg Matthews, um, some of the other people that we had heard from earlier um, had all surrendered their phones, or not all of them, but the, the main people in it, Dallas Kennedy, had surrendered their phones to us on consent. Um, so we were going through those downloads and through that data. And you testified earlier there was a, a second search done at the, the Berkeley Road residence. Correct. Right? And at what point um, did you ultimately respond to the Berkeley residents? So I responded out to the scene in front of the Berkeley residents on Monday night when Mr. Peterson had called us in reference to the scene that he found in front of his house. Um, I had went out there, uh, Sergeant Yankee and Sergeant Tilly, along with some other people were already out there processing the scene. Um, I responded out there to the scene to see what they had. And I guess 
Was the second search warrant of the residence completed before or after that search of the roadway? The, the, the stuff that was found out in the roadway by Mr. Peterson is what led us to draft another search warrant to do a second search of the residence because we had that additional information. Okay. And you have been to uh, Mr. Dietrich and Ms. Vanderheiden's residence on Berkeley Road? On the inside? Uh, to the actual residence? I've been to the residence and up until recently I was never inside. And are you aware whether or not that location is within Brown County, Wisconsin? Correct, in the village or town of Ledgeview. Brown County, Wisconsin? Correct. During the investigation, was it ultimately determined uh, that investigators would uh, take Mr. Dietrich into custody? Correct. Um, I had, um, on Monday, the, the 23rd, when we responded out to that scene um, in front of the residence, I had discussed briefly with Lieutenant Valley and Captain Conrath as to the direction of the investigation. We decided that based on the initial evidence that we had and the initial information that we had that we would arrest Doug Dietrich. And you were involved in that decision? I was. Can you let us know what factors played into that decision? Sure. Well, the, up until that night, or I'm, I'm sorry, up until Monday night, the 23rd, we really weren't sure where, the, um, where Nicole was killed. Obviously, we knew where the body was located. Um, Monday night, we had this crime scene um, close proximity to their residence. Um, at the time, we had known about this herringbone pattern that was on her back. I knew that these shoes were found in the garage, which um, had about five or six red stains on the bottom that appeared to be possibly could have been blood. Uh, we also had some blood in the garage that was located near Ms. Van where Ms. Vanderheiden's vehicle was that was presumptively tested for blood. And then looking at the photographs of Ms. Vanderheiden's vehicle, it appeared that there was a lot of smudges, there was a lot of stains um, that may have been consistent with blood. So at that time, um, we had thought that that vehicle was potentially used to transport uh, her body. And there was also suspected blood located within the residence? Yeah, it, there was a few little um, areas that I was advised of that um, up in a bathtub and then also at the lower bathroom, um, there was some tissues with blood and then a sweatshirt uh, with blood that was located um, in that lower bathroom. And where uh, was Mr. Dietrich ultimately arrested? Um, Sergeant Steffens and I, or Sergeant Holzbach, I'm sorry, um, she had had a good rapport with Mr. Dietrich, so she made a phone call to him asking him to meet with us again. He agreed, advised us he was at his parents' residence, um, which is a short distance away from his house. Uh, myself, Sergeant Holzbach, and Lieutenant White uh, then drove over to Mr. Dietrich's parents' residence to make contact with him. Did you personally take Mr. Dietrich into custody? I did. They were uh, they knew we were coming, so their um, Doug and his mother were waiting for us at the door, and um, greeted us at the door. I asked Doug to step out of the residence and explained to him that he was being arrested, and um, placed him into handcuffs and transported him to the Brown County Jail. And prior to that, Mr. Dietrich voluntarily advised you of his location. Correct. When you placed Mr. Dietrich into custody, uh, were you able to observe his demeanor? Yeah, I, I would describe it as, and you know, I, I'm not great with words all the time, but I would describe it as like someone just, you know, killed your dog. It was just like a, a blank, like, I can't believe this is happening stare that he had, um, like probably a moment of shock. Um, and then it was a short time later, once we uh, placed Mr. Dietrich into our vehicle, um, that he broke down and started crying and um, was real emotional. If you can generally discuss the arrest procedure. When, when you make an arrest, are you charging an individual? No, so as, as law enforcement, I know there's a the misconception out there, and even as somebody, um, you know, when you're going through school, you don't have a great understanding of it until you actually do the job. So law enforcement will make an arrest based on facts that they have, based on statements they have, based on evidence they have, place somebody in jail, and then we do uh, what's called the referral to the Brown County District Attorney's Office in this case, where they'll review our reports, they'll review the information that we provide to them, and then ultimately the charging is up to the Brown County District Attorney's Office if they're gonna actually charge somebody or not. When you make an arrest, is that the end of your investigation? No, the, the arrest is, I mean, 
probably the majority of the work is post arrest, I would say, because um, we want to make sure that you know, the person we have in custody is the right person. And if, if it's not, we want to exonerate that person. And are you aware of how long Mr. Dietrich was in custody for? Um, it was 18, 19 days. During that time period, is the investigation continuing? Oh, absolutely. Um, during that time, I was um, continuing to review surveillance, continuing to go through the evidence that was collected, in particular um, swabs that were taken. Um, sending those into the crime lab. I was put into communication with uh, analyst Kevin Scott down in Madison who was assigned to this case. Um, he was keeping in constant communication with me as far as his findings on things that I was sending into him. And based upon um, what he was telling me was um, gearing my direction on next items that I would send into the lab. Let's discuss the, the items that were sent to the lab. Uh, as the lead investigator, were you primarily responsible for deciding what items got sent to the lab? For the most part, I, I believe there is upwards of 13, 14 evidence transmittals that we did. Um, evidence transmittals are forms that I would fill out, um, provide to our evidence technician. That way they can take those items out of evidence and package them up and have them um, sent to the crime lab. And an evidence transmittal can be as small as one item or it could be up to 15, 20 items. So. To say I did every one, I did not, but the majority of them I did. But you are aware of what was sent ultimately? Correct. Ultimately, the decision to send certain items was up to me, whether I filled the form out or not may not have been the case. And are you able to approximate the number of items uh, that were put into evidence in this case? Put into evidence? I, I would have to guess probably 350 to 400 items of evidentiary value were taken throughout the investigation. And are you able to send all of those items at one time to the crime lab? I wish. And we tried sending a lot more than we were allowed to send because obviously we wanted answers quick. Um, there are policies and procedures that they have that we have to abide by. And typically that is 10 items at a time. And then once they're done processing those items, they advise us and then we can send some more. Um, unfortunately, it's not like you see on TV and you can put an item in a machine and it gives you an answer in an hour. It, it takes some time, but I'm sure they can speak of later. In determining what items got sent to the lab, did you select the first 10 items that were collected? Uh, not necessarily collected. The first 10 items that were collected, no. It, it, did, it didn't have anything to do with the order in which they were collected. And how did you determine which items in which order were sent to the lab? Uh, well, we looked at all the items that we had. The clothing that was discovered on the highway was obviously very important to us. The items in front of the house were very important to us first to determine whether in fact that blood was in fact Nikki's blood. Um, and as well as some of the other items from the garage. The, the, the items we were focusing on at the beginning was in relation to Doug because we wanted to make sure again that this was something he was responsible for and, and uh, those items would be able to lead us to that or not. And did you send in swabs from or that were collected from uh, Nikki's body as well? Correct. And again, after you send those items to the lab initially, you said you remained in contact with the DNA analyst? Correct. Kevin Scott would contact me probably daily um, and advise, give me updates on what he was doing, and I would call him, I'm sure he'd tell you a couple times a day sometimes. Um, just to maintain contact and find out what they had going on and what, what I needed to get ready to send in next. In addition to the items that were sent to the lab, uh, what other investigative uh, steps were taken during those 18 or 19 days? So I was advised, like you heard earlier, by I believe it was uh, analyst Hoffmeyer that she had found this uh, snapshot device um, within Nicole's vehicle. And I'm, I was familiar with that through a different company. It's not the same company, but it's a device that's typically used to plug into your vehicle's computer system, tracks your driving behavior, your driving miles, max speed, things like that. It's used for um, insurance rates. So if you're a safe driver, if you're not excessively braking, if you're not excessively speeding, you know, depending upon how many miles you drive, all that goes into your insurance rates. So some people decide to use those to try and get lower insurance rates. Did you ultimately draft a subpoena for those records? I did. I was advised of the serial number off of the device that the crime lab had found. 
Um, so I s drafted a subpoena for Progressive Insurance and submitted that to them so that I could get the records from that device. From an investigative standpoint, why did you feel it's significant to determine that information with respect to Nikki's car? Well, come ahead. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Just had a sidebar in terms of the, uh, the nature and any uh, sp perspective issues with the testimony. Um, we know how we're going to proceed at this time. Go ahead, Attorney Saunders. And again, um, my question was from an investigative standpoint, um, why did you feel it necessary to obtain those records with respect to Nikki's car? Well, at the time, uh, we had the indications that that car was potentially used to transport her body, so I felt like that device would be able to give us information from the car, whether it was actually driven or not, during that time frame. In addition to that evidence, uh, what other investigative measures uh, did you look at? Well, I was also in contact, with, besides Kevin Scott, with the two um, individuals that you had just had up here on the stand, speaking to them as far as what they found um, and their analysis of the the Buick Rendezvous, as well as the other Buick, uh, which was Doug, not Doug, which was Greg Matthews' vehicle. At any point, uh, apart from Nikki and Greg's vehicles, uh, did investigators look at Doug's vehicle? We did seize Doug's vehicle from the watering hole. Um, we did not send that one into the crime lab to be searched. Um, the process you heard, like these last two vehicles, simply because we, we knew that that vehicle was at the watering hole all night, so that the time was accounted for for that vehicle. And in fact, Mr. Dietrich's vehicle was ultimately towed from uh, the watering hole? Correct. His vehicle was towed from the watering hole and then brought to the Brown County Sheriff's Office, where we subsequently did do a search of it, um, just not to the extent that you heard with the other two vehicles. And was anything of evidentiary value located in Mr. Dietrich's vehicle? No. In addition to, to searches of vehicles, uh, were you also obtaining phone records during this time? Correct. Obtaining phone records, going through phone records, as you can imagine, there's a lot of data to go through, text messages, phone calls, times, things like that, trying to verify statements that people had given us um, to make sure that the statements they give us were accurate. And did you continue to obtain uh, witness statements uh, during this period as well? Yeah, I mean, we had a good portion of our witness statements at that time. Um, in going through some of the video, especially from the sardine can, we were in the process of trying to uh, determine who was all at that bar to try and identify them, and in particular, anyone that Nikki may have talked to. Um, and, and the other thing we did during that time was we really needed to figure out how Nikki got home. Um, we had our time frame at that point that she was last seen walking at, you know, 1230, 1236. And then we knew from Mr. Peterson's calling in through the joggers test, through the joggers statement, um, that our crime scene would have likely happened sometime around 5:30, 5:45. So we had that window. Um, so our main priority at that point was to figure out how Nikki got home. We, we asked for the assistance of the public through through the media, through um, Facebook, um, and anyone that may have seen her that night, anyone that may have given her a ride home. We checked with all the local cab companies. Um, we were going to check with Uber. However, through looking at her phone, she did not have an Uber app on there. It's my understanding that that's the only way to get an Uber, so we didn't go down that route. Um, but our main priority at that point was to figure out how Nikki got from the area of the sardine can to her residence and what happened during that time. Are you also drafting search warrants for uh, the phones of, of individuals? Yes, for, for people, we, we did do consensual downloads on some phones, and then we also went back and, and did search warrants as well. There's, there's two types of search warrants. You know, you can do a physical search warrant for the phone where you're actually hooking it up to a machine um, where it actually extracts the data from it, and then you'd also write a search warrant to the phone company, AT&T, US Cellular, Verizon, or whatever, to get their physical phone records. So there would be two separate warrants written for whichever uh, measure we were going with at that point. You did ultimately obtain and review the, the phone records and information from Mr. Dietrich's phone. Correct. And why was that significant? Uh, it was significant to compare to his statements that he had given us um, to see if there was any inconsistencies in his story versus data that we would have had on his phone as far as locations, as far as conversations, as far as phone calls. What did that information reveal? 
Um, all that information reviewed that um, all the information that Doug Dietrich gave us was accurate. Um, you know, outside of a, maybe a few minutes here and there that were off, um, which anyone would probably do on their night out, um, everything was consistent with what he had originally told us. Presumably from your prior answer, uh, the length of time Mr. Dietrich was in custody, uh, was he ultimately uh, released? Yes, he was ultimately re released, I'm sorry, um, based on a lot of facts that were learned through those 18, 19 days in the investigation. Um, the information we got back from Progressive showed that vehicle did not move. Um, some of the swabs that they had talked about earlier, the, the one swab from the garage, um, from the car that was deemed to be blood was not Nicole's blood um, from the crime lab. The blood that was found in the garage by the vehicle turned out not to be human blood. We later verified with Mr. Dietrich as well as um, some other members of Nicole's family that Doug had shot a turkey a couple weeks prior and that blood in the garage was likely turkey blood. Um, the shoes that were taken from the house with the herringbone pattern with the five to six spots on the bottom um, were tested for Nicole's DNA. Um, the spots on the bottom were tested for blood and I was advised that only one of the six or five spots on the bottom tested inconclusive for blood, but then I was also told that if that was blood, that they would have had a positive DNA hit. So all these pieces of evidence that we thought we had, um, you know, turned out to be, and ha turned out to have answers for them. And, and I'll, I'd also add that during that time, we were also, I was in contact with Kevin Scott and he was advising me of this consistent unknown male Y profile that was coming up on the items that we were sending to the lab um, that was not consistent with Mr. Dietrich's. We've also heard testimony with respect to a, um, whether Mr. Dietrich had access to, to Ms. Vanderheide and his vehicle. Uh, do you, did you obtain any information with respect to that? Sure, so like we had talked about earlier, um, we saw the picture where there's the keys in the hallway and there was keys there that were leading out to the garage and that was actually something that initially I thought was suspicious as well. May, may we have made a re, uh, reapproach? Well, why don't we do this ladies and gentlemen, but now we have been at it for about an hour and 15 minutes, let's take a brief break at this time, all right? All rise. Yes, no. And, um, Take a swinger, why don't you retake the stand? You're still under oath. Council, whenever you're ready, you can continue. So before we left off, well, we were discussing uh, the vehicle of Nicole Vanderheide. Remember that? Correct. Okay. And that was in evidence at Brown County Sheriff's Office at that time? Um, it got transported to the Wausau Crime Lab, and then when they were done processing it, it was transported back to the Brown County Sheriff's Office, correct? At a certain point, did investigators release the vehicle back to uh, Nicole's family? Yeah, once it had been processed and we got it back, it was later in June, I, I can't recall the exact date, um, I made contact with Nicole's father and made arrangements to return the vehicle to them. Prior to releasing the vehicle, did you attempt to start that vehicle? I did. The keys that were sent, down, sent with the vehicle to the crime lab were um, the keys that were found in the hallway um, at the residence on that key rack. Um, I attempted to start the vehicle using those keys and was unsuccessful. Can you describe why you were unsuccessful or how you were unsuccessful? Well, it was embarrassing because I had called um, the Myers to come and pick up the vehicle and I couldn't get started. Uh, I put in the ignition, turned the key, um, the lights would come on, radio would come on, heater would start, couldn't figure it out. So I went back and talked to our mechanics and they hooked up a computer thing to it to see if maybe something had happened with the battery or the computer that had messed with the starter. That wasn't it. Um, after a little bit of thinking, we realized that um, some of the GM vehicles back around that time had what are called valet keys that are only used to open the door and used to um, go to the accessory position in the car. And the key you attempted to use, uh, where was that key located? Those were the keys that were located in the hallway at the residence. Of whose residence? Of the Dietrich residence, I'm sorry. Were any other vehicles for that vehicle located, or were any other keys, rather, for that vehicle located in the residence? No. Uh, were you ultimately able to start the vehicle? 
Yes. Um, finally, when we had realized that um, after some time, I uh, we I knew I had Nikki's car keys that were located with the rest of her property on the side of the highway that were in her purse. So I proceeded to um, get a hold of the evidence technician, remove that key from evidence temporarily, well not temporarily, permanently, um, bring that out to the vehicle, use that key, and then the car started right up. And the vehicle is returned to um, Heather's father, or I'm sorry, Nicole's father. So we discussed the release of Mr. Dietrich. After that, did the investigation continue? Correct. We were we were back at uh, well, technically square one. Trying, we still had that unknown answer as to how Nicole got home that that morning. So that that's where our investigation focused. Um, we went back to video from the crime, or I'm sorry, from the sardine can. If you recall, there was that one text message where Nicole had sent a message to Doug stating, "I found someone. Um, good thing I found someone." Um, we worked to try and identify who that person was by watching video surveillance. Um, we were able to identify that male subject and later make contact with him. And what other, uh, apart from reviewing surveillance video, what other techniques are you utilizing at that point? So it's the people that we were coming across, like I just explained, the male that we had uh, identified, Jason Lemons, he voluntarily met with me, provided a written statement on his encounter with Nicole that night, um, also provided a DNA buckle swab consensually that was sent to the lab to test against the um, Y profiles or the DNA that we had already been discovering on some of the items. Um, there was other individuals that we were trying to track down, again, continuing to watch surveillance video from a bunch of different locations, including like the Greystone Ale House, um, the Shell Gas Station, which were all locations, Brown County Sheriff's Department, um, which all have video surveillance of that general area. And what was the purpose of reviewing those uh, video surveillance images? Again, to try and see if um, a car would have come and gone in that time frame that we had. Um, you don't think about it at the time, but when you sit down and watch that intersection at that time of night, there is still plenty of traffic activity for a little while there, so it was pretty difficult to try and pick anything out in particular. We didn't have much luck with that route. And are you continuing to send items down to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? Correct. So I'm in, also in contact with Kevin Scott continuously, um, getting his, he would make phone calls to me daily, um, telling me his findings, and um, we would briefly discuss the other items that I had in evidence, and we would discuss it together to try and decide what would be a best item that he may be able to extract any sort of uh, DNA evidence from. He had it, it told me, you know, some of the specific items were too bloody for him to test um, because I'm sure he'll testify later to the fact that the blood would, you know, overpower any sort of touch DNA or anything that would have been there. And during this time, you're in communication with Kevin Scott regarding those results? Correct. And at a certain point, were you advised of a uh, DNA hit? Yes. So on August 19, 2016, um, Kevin Scott had called me and told me that one of the recent items that we had sent into the lab for analysis, um, a sock that was taken off of uh, Nikki's body, uh, he was able to extract a, a DNA sample from that sock that he then entered into a um, DNA database, so to speak, um, and he was able to get a DNA match. And. Who was the individual that Mr. Scott advised that match was for? Uh, he advised me that it was for a George Stephen Birch. Prior to that occasion, I believe you said August 19th, uh, had you had any knowledge of uh, uh, Mr. Birch? I had not. <laughs> what did you do at that point? Um, so obviously you can imagine um, we had a little bit of spirit in the office that day as uh, we were continually sending items in. and not getting much luck back other than the unknown Y profile. So as soon as I got that name, um, I sat down at the computer and checked our police databases. We have a Pro Phoenix database, which is a database that the Brown County Sheriff's Office as well as other um, entities within Brown County use. And then the Green Bay Police Department uses a program called GERP, um, Green Bay Electronic Reporting Program that we also have access to. Um, so I checked those two databases um, for any police contacts um, that Mr. Birch may have had with them. Did you find uh, an occasion of a police contact? I did. In June, uh, June 8th of 2016, I noted a police contact with the Green Bay Police Department. And did you look into that incident? I did. Not specifically, but as far as uh, the reports? I did. And 
were you able to locate a, uh, a cell phone extraction associated with that case? Yes. Uh, and who was that for? The cell phone extraction was that of George uh, Stephen Burchess. And did you review that extraction? I did. I contacted the Green Bay Police Department. Um, in particular, these types of records are typically kept digitally due to the, the high volume. It would be tough to print out that much information. Contacted them, requested a copy of that, um, made arrangements with Sergeant Yankee so that she could go and pick that item up for me and bring that back to me at the Sheriff's Department. And did you personally have the, the opportunity to review that material? I did. I got it later that day, um, put it into my computer, briefly reviewed some of the messages um, and things like that that were located on the phone. Did you locate any uh, email addresses for the defendant? Yes, there was a, on, on a lot of your phones that you get nowadays with smartphones, whether it be an Apple or a Samsung, you typically can associate your email address with it so that you can get emails to your phone. Um, this particular phone was a Samsung, or this particular download indicated to me that it was a Samsung Galaxy phone, and then it also had a Gmail account associated to it. I believe it was sbirch214 at gmail.com or something like that. I don't, I don't know if that was exactly it. And why was that significant uh, to you? Uh, well, information that I had through recent trainings and recent conversation was with coworkers is that Google um, has this thing called the Google Dashboard that is associated with your email account, which um, can tr will track your locations uh, based upon um, GPS, Wi-Fi, and cell phone tower data. And ultimately, uh, did you draft a a subpoena for those records? I did not personally. Uh, I directed or uh, worked with Sergeant Lopnow to do that. He took the information that we had based off from that download and he completed a search warrant for uh, to Google for those results. What other investigative steps were taken at that point? Um, at that point it was just background finding out who, who is George Birch, um, what are his ties to Green Bay, where does he live, where does he work. Um, I had contacted one of the officers that was involved in that call from June 8th who I knew and um, asked him if he re recalled anything about that or remembered anything about that and he said he did and he said as a matter of fact um, uh, Let's come forward All right, we just had a sidebar in terms of trying to avoid some other issues and uh, again, there's an understanding here and we can proceed with uh, the testimony so after learning of that Green Bay incident, did you conduct any uh, surveillance of Mr. Birch? I did. So um, am I, can I go where I was going with the rest of my conversation? No, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll go on to the surveillance of Mr. Birch. Okay. So I was apprised of a, a possible address for Mr. Birch. Um, I drove out there that day, and I'd also received a picture of Mr. Birch um, and also found it on his Facebook account, so I had an idea of what he looked like. Um, I went on to... Um, 15th Street in the city of Green Bay, which runs off of West Mason Street. And as I turned down the street, started driving northbound, um, I observed Mr. Burt standing out in front of the residence at, uh, on 15th. Do you recall that address? 515, I believe. I could I be wrong. 51215, is that correct? Sure. I apologize. And Counsel, I remember to, uh, one thing I forgot to tell all the attorneys, the jury's having some of the jurors are having a hard time hearing your questions. Make sure you speak up. Go sure. ahead. And were you ultimately able to determine whose residence that was? Uh, through a pattern of behavior. Um, you know, we saw him coming and going on a regular basis. So based on that, believed that um, George lived there. Uh, we didn't want to alert him to us, our surveillance techniques. So I didn't make any contact at the residence. I didn't make contact with the potential owner of the residence, um, fearing that. You know, it may lead to him fleeing or whatever. In directing your attention to September 7th of 2016, uh, on that date, did you make an arrest of Mr. Birch? I did. Uh, and were you personally involved in that arrest? I was. Did you have personal contact with Mr. Birch on that day? Briefly. And the person you had contact, do you see that person in court today? I do. Could you please point out what that person's wearing and where that person is sitting? Uh, George Birch is wearing a blue and gray plaid button-down shirt, long sleeve. Um, looks basically the same today as he did then, besides uh, some longer hair. 
And could you please point out for the record where he is sitting? He is seated to my right, um, second one from the end at the defense table. And has the record reflect the witness identified the defendant? Any objection? Okay. The record will reflect that the witness has identified the defendant in open court. You may continue. Did you later uh, obtain a buckle swab from Mr. Birch? Yes. Um, after his arrest, I um, we compiled the search warrant, had it reviewed, and then ultimately signed by a judge. And then I went back out to the Brown County Jail and executed that search warrant. Was that buckle swab ultimately entered into evidence in this case? It was. I um, took the buckle swab from Mr. Birch and then immediately turned that over to Sergeant Thomas, who then in turn um, brought that item directly down to the Wisconsin Crime Lab so that it could be uh, tested. In addition to Mr. Birch's buckle, uh, you, you mentioned at length, uh, you continue to send additional evidence down to the crime lab, is that correct? Correct. During that time, um, after Doug's release, um, we obviously continued to explore other investigative uh, means. We kept our minds open on the investigation, um, called in numerous people, including uh, Nicole's ex-husband, who came in voluntarily, provided us a statement, provided us his cell phone, uh, provided us with a buckle swab, and there was also other individuals that we had uh, found at the bar that night that we ultimately were able to track down and talk to um, and get their DNA swabs as well. Um, like I said, we, we didn't know how she had gotten home that night, so that's kind of where we were at. In addition to the various buckle swabs of, of individuals, are you also sending swabs from Nicole's body? Correct. So we went through um, the 80 or however many swabs that Dr. Rogalska spoke about earlier, um, picked locations throughout that body that we felt that there may be some sort of touch DNA present. Are you also sending swabs uh, and items from Nicole's clothing? Yes, most of those were sent um, right away just so that we could make sure that we determined, in fact, those were her clothes with um, the blood and the DNA that would have been on those clothes so that we could just make certain that we had you know, the, the crime scenes to find. And when all of those items were sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab, did you follow proper uh, protocol in doing that? Yes, we fill out, like I explained earlier, evidence transmittal sheets, which puts our property number and our case number on it. We give that to our evidence custodian at the sheriff's office. She goes in, picks those items out. We double check the, the, the numbers on the stickers with the numbers I asked for, and then we package them and send them to the lab. Uh, on occasion, some of the stuff was driven down there personally by one of our investigators if it would have been more of a rush item. I'm sorry, in addition to the uh, swabs from Nicole's body and her clothing, did you also send swabs recovered from the, the cord that was located in this case? Correct. In addition to those items, also uh, swabs from the residents, the Nikki and Doug's residents were sent to the lab as well? Correct, as well as swabs from Doug and from the two, two children on his, um, on the other, on her other, from her other marriage. I know for the questions at this time, we did discuss that uh, Sergeant Slinger uh, would be recalled to discuss additional portions of his testimony uh, at a later date. Understood, well. It's almost 12.15, ladies and gentlemen. It's a good time for our lunch break before we start cross-examination. 1.15. Have a good lunch. All right.